thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, I would have uh, preferred to present my uh, my talk today in Filipino, but I'm assuming this is an international uh, congress, so I'm I will be using English for my presentation. Uh, but if you want to interact with me in Filipino, ask me questions in Tagalog, please please do so. Wag lang bisaya kasi bisaya ko medyo medyo mahina yung bisaya natin. All right. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share screen and uh, I'm gonna share with you the slides that, uh, that I prepared for today. And I was asked to uh, present a topic which is very, very timely. And it's about the uh, economic perspective of the premises and promises of the uh, Maharlika Investment Fund. Okay, so that is what I am going uh, to discuss uh, this morning. And uh, this uh, uh, program, the Maharlika Investment Fund, is a very, very relevant one because it was just uh, signed into law last July 18. It's now called Republic Act 11954, which is uh, which is a very long title. And uh, I would rather just call it uh, the Maharlika Investment Fund Act. Okay, So you can see here in the picture, which I screen grabbed from the uh, Malacanang, uh, 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 Malacanang YouTube channel, you can see here the president and uh, the members of Congress behind him as he is signing into law the Maharlika Investment Fund Act. Uh, now, what's interesting with this uh, Maharlika Investment Fund is how fast it passed through uh, the, the House and in the Senate. In fact, uh, by late November of last year, uh, it was uh, initially passed as a House bill or submitted rather as a House Bill number 6398. Okay? And eventually in December, it became 6608. I remember uh, when it was first uh, um, introduced, the 6398, I was already providing comments about this uh, uh, when I was interviewed in various media outlets there in the Philippines. And uh, it evolved into House Bill 6608, and then it went to first and second reading on the 12th of December. And then uh, in the third, uh, it got into third reading in December 15, and on the same day, it passed the House of Representatives uh, with 279 votes in favor and six against. And uh, after a few months, you know, after December, it became quiet. And uh, in May 24, the president said that, you know what, this uh, piece of legislation should be urgent. Okay, so he certified it as urgent. And it became so fast, by May 31st, it passed the Senate with 19 in favor one against and one abstain. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the one against is Senator Risa Hontiveros and the one that, who abstained was Senator Nancy Biner. Uh, and, and also on that same day, the House of Representatives accepted the Senate version. Because normally it would go through a bicameral conference committee. What the members of the House uh, said, that, okay, you know what, we accept your version. On the 5th of July, uh, the final copy of the bill was transmitted to the president and we know uh, on July 18, which is a few days ago, the president signed it into law, which is now called RA-119954. What's interesting is the speed of passage. Okay? It's the speed of passage, but at the same time, people don't understand what the Maharlika Fund is. Uh, a, a survey by the social weather stations that was released uh, last uh, March, March of 2023, is, is quite revealing. It says here, okay, they asked the respondents the question, how would you describe your knowledge about the Maharlika Wealth Fund that is being promoted by the government? 47% of their respondents said almost nothing or nothing. 33% only a little and 15% partial but sufficient. And you have 5% that you know they, they know it so well. If you, took, if you were to combine the, the red you know, uh, shades of this pie chart and the blue, that would be 80%, which means that uh, eight out of 10 Filipinos have almost nothing or only little understanding or knowledge of the Maharlika Wealth Fund or Maharlika Investment Fund. So uh, this is uh, uh, quite revealing. I mean, this is an important piece of legislation, an important program of the current government, but people don't understand it. Okay, So there is a problem. And in fact, uh, I would like to acknowledge your university for actually taking the uh, initiative 
of inviting me to actually explain it to your students, faculty, and everybody here in attendance about what the Maharlika Wealth Fund is. Because it's very important, and you can see here that you know eight out of 10 Filipinos have very little to none of their understanding of this. All right, um, so what is the Maharlika Investment Fund anyway? So what it is, is that uh, it's, a, it's an investment vehicle uh, and, and the goal is to draw domestic and foreign capital, including those from global financial institutions and multilateral partners. What it is envisioned to do is that it, it will be an alternative source of funding to support capital intensive projects, such as those uh, infrastructure projects under the Build Better More program. Now, the, uh, the law itself that was signed by the president a few days ago, it, th that law itself declared the objectives of the Maharlika Investment Fund. And I'm not going to read everything here, but uh, I'm just gonna pick some pieces that are important. So what it is, is that uh, the Maharlika Investment Fund will promote socioeconomic development, okay? And how will it do that? Well, it will be achieved by making strategic and profitable investments in key sectors, okay? And of course, keeping in mind that the value of the fund uh, has to be uh, preserved, okay? And of course, to obtain optimal and absolute uh, um, return and achieve financial gains on its investments. So in other words, the goal is to have the, the, the fund profitable, but at the same time, use the, the profit or use the fund itself to finance projects, programs of the government. And the ultimate overarching goal is to promote socioeconomic development, okay? Now, I remember there was some discussion uh, uh, in, in, in media with, uh, with people asking like, what is it really? Is it a sovereign wealth fund? Is it a, uh, uh, an investment fund? You know, is it like a, a slush fund, you know? Or is it, so what is it really? Well, uh, the Maharlika Investment Fund can be any of those, okay? Except a slush fund. The slush fund, that's, that's for corruption. We're gonna discuss corruption later. But the, but the point I wanna make is that the way the Maharlika Investment Fund is defined it is very flexible and it's very malleable that it can, uh, it can be uh, an investment fund and it can be a wealth fund. It can generate value, but at the same time, it can be used as an investment to finance uh, 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 the infrastructure programs of the government. Now, the question is, do we really need the Maharlika investment? Is there really a need for this? Well, let's look at the data itself. So, in terms of infrastructure funding, if we were to uh, look at the public investment program of the government, the data that I have here with you was uh, taken from the NEDA. Okay, so I have the, I mean, the. by the way, throughout this presentation, you can see links, you know, uh, in, in, you know, below the slides right there. That is where I took the information because I don't want to be accused of misinformation. That's the that's the, the thing that I'm so against of, you know, like misinformation. And that's why all of my claims here, all of the, the facts, the, the data, they're linked. So you can have, uh, you can do your own homework at home. Um, now, in terms of the public investment program, we can see here that 96% of those programs come, are, are funded through the General Appropriations Act, which is the national budget. Um, about 3% from official development assistance and 1% for the public-private partnership. Now for the Build Better More program, the numbers are a little bit different. The General Appropriations Act funds 34% of the projects, ODA, which is official development assistance, 41%, public partnership, uh, sorry, public-private partnership, 23%. Now, why am I showing you this? The reason why I'm showing you this is that the Maharlika Investment Fund can act as a funding source for these infrastructure uh, or investment programs, okay? And uh, by doing so, it can relieve the government of fiscal strain, okay? Uh, in other words, for example, instead of using the General Appropriations Act, 96%, we can reduce that to some percentage and use the Maharlika Fund instead, okay? So we can use the Maharlika Fund to finance these projects. Now, I mentioned fiscal space earlier. So we can see here that uh, because of the uh, pandemic, our budget deficit has ballooned you know, uh, uh, to as high as around uh, close to 9% of our GDP. Now it sits at around somewhere in between six to 7% of our GDP. Okay? And we can see here that government debt has increased. 
our debt to GDP ratio has been uh, more than 60% right now. I think it sits at 61, 62%. But uh, the uh, 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 external debt sits at around 30, 35%. Okay, so it's still a healthy number in so far as external debt is concerned. But what is alarming is we're actually borrowing more and more and more, which is alarming in my opinion. So all the more we need the Maharlika Investment Fund because if the Maharlika Investment Fund can finance these uh, public in, uh, investment programs or public infrastructure programs, uh, it can relieve the government of you know spending and use the Maharlika Fund to, to you know to finance those projects and thereby rely less on borrowing. Okay. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention here is that. Uh, uh, we are on our way to become a middle-income economy uh, in, in the next uh, few years. And if we become a middle-income uh, economy, the problem is that we won't be able to uh, have access to foreign borrowing at really good interest rates. Because the, the, the idea is that now we have graduated to another level. So which means that by the time we get to middle-income country status, we should be able to have our own sources of funding, which means that the Maharlika Investment Fund fits right there uh, in terms of a possible fin uh, a source of funding for a government by the time that we become a middle-income country. Now, our neighbors already have sovereign wealth funds and investment funds. Um, you have Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, and Vietnam. They all have the these uh, sovereign wealth funds. Uh, for example, the oldest in my list was established in 1974, which is Temasek, which is just uh, for Singapore. And uh, we can see here that, uh, for example, for the case of Indonesia, uh, the most that's the most recent one, uh, 2021, their initial capital was 5 billion uh, and their initial funding source was their state budget. Now their current assets sits at 6 billion. So 2021, they have 5 billion in assets, okay? That's the, the initial capital. And then after a year, it increased to 6 billion. So in a span of one year, we saw an increase in 1 billion in terms of asset growth for the Indonesia sovereign wealth fund. And of course, there is empirical evidence to support that sovereign wealth funds actually help with economic growth. Um, there's one research that uh, comes into mind. Uh, by the way, this is a research conference, so that's why I've included uh, the source here. So I got this from the Journal of Asset Management. So the paper is entitled Sovereign Wealth Funds and Economic Growth, written by Afuso et al., published in 2022. And what they looked at is the sovereign wealth fund for the country of Trinidad and Tobago. And what they found was that uh, the establishment of their sovereign wealth fund contributed to a higher real GDP per capita by an estimate of around $5,000 per year. And if you look at it for 30 years, the welfare impact of the fund is around $107,000 per person in a span of 30 years. Okay, so the, 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 the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that for those who are naysayers about the Maharlika Fund, there is an empirical evidence to say that indeed it will help us with economic growth. Okay, so that's for the case of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, where are we going to get the funding for the Maharlika Investment Fund? I mean, look, if, if I were to show you the fiscal space data that we have, we are in a budget deficit. You know, we're we're borrowing at increasing numbers. So where are we getting the funding sources? Well, I, I saw this cartoon the other day, okay? <laughs> and it, it, it gave me, uh, 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 you know, it, it gave me some reaction that, wait a minute. So I can see here uh, the, a cartoon representation of our president holding a pail, which says MIF, which apparently stands for the Maharlika Investment Fund. And you see here the Carabao who's really skin and thin and skinny and thin, and, uh, and and it's scared to be being milked, right? So to me, it represents the 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 the, the idea that oh, the Philippines is bank, uh, doesn't have any resources to spare for the Maharlika Investment Fund. Okay, and you saw the data earlier that you know we are in a deficit and, and that we're increasingly our borrowings have increased, and also um, uh, Diva Bunigundo, who I know. Uh, said that uh, in, 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 uh, in a letter, I think it was a public uh, letter uh, addressed to the president, 
saying that uh, you know we that we have nothing to invest at this point, right? So according to him, and I quote. Uh, the Philippines is no recipient of any of these surpluses. So he's referring to uh, uh, current account surpluses or, or budget surpluses. So he said, essentially, we have nothing to invest. But do we? <laughs> do we have something to use for the Maharlika Fund? So let's look at where the funding source comes from. So uh, the, the, the total authorized capital for the Maharlika Fund is $500 billion, Okay. And uh, it, this represents 75% of that it's called common shares. These are the shares that have voting rights. It's worth 375 billion, 75% of 500 billion. The rest are preferred shares. So in other words, if some private person who wish to invest in the Maharlika Fund, they could, uh, uh, they could uh, uh, buy shares, preferred shares up to 125 billion. Now, where does the initial investment come from? Well, it comes from several sources. So first is from the national government, which, which is uh, at 50 billion, and it will come from the dividends of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. And uh, another source is the, uh, the Philippine Amusement Gaming Corporation, which by the way, has a new logo that I really don't like. Uh, the, the logo, uh, the logo, but Pagor, sorry, the Pagor uh, uh, contribution is 10% of its gaming revenues. And there are other sources from privatization, royalties from natural resource extraction. Put that together, that's 50 billion that will come from the national government. It's important to note that none of these are General Appropriations Act elements. Okay, so there's no mention of General Appropriations Act. Okay, next. Uh, there are two government financial institutions that will contribute also to the fund. So you have the Land Bank of the Philippines at 50 billion. And by the way, that 50 billion represents only 1.6% of its assets. And you have the Development Bank of the Philippines at 25 billion, and that 25 billion represents merely 2.4% of its assets. Okay. So that is where uh, uh, the initial uh, investments will come from. Now, so, so remember earlier, uh, Diwa Gunigundo said that, you know what, the Philippines doesn't have any surpluses. You know, we don't, we're, we're in a budget deficit. We, are, uh, uh, we don't have any current account surplus. You know, our, our, we are importing more than we're exporting. He's correct, right? But that doesn't mean that we cannot establish our own sovereign wealth fund in the midst of a budget deficit, in the midst of a current account deficit, in the midst of a trade imbalance. Let me show you. For the case of the Indonesia Investment Authority, the Sovereign Wealth Fund for Indonesia, when it was established in 2021, it was in the middle of COVID, mind you, and they were sitting at around close to 5% uh, budget deficit in terms of its percentage to GDP, close to 5%, okay, budget deficit. Um, Peru, so Peru, they have their own Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is called the Fondo de Estabilización, uh, Estabiliza Estabilización Fiscal. And uh, when it was established in 1999, they were sitting at a budget deficit of around 2.35% of their GDP. Uh, India. So India, they have their sovereign wealth fund, which is the National Investment Infrastructure Fund. Uh, it was established in 2015, and they were sitting at 3.87% uh, of their GDP in deficit, budget deficit. It sits at close to 4% of their GDP. So these other countries were able to establish their sovereign wealth funds in the middle of a budget deficit. Why can't we? Okay. So th this kind of thinking that that Philippines uh, is is not you know we're not supposed to have a sovereign wealth fund because we are in the middle of a budget deficit that we're in the middle of a current account deficit. This is the kind of thinking that will uh, that's not going to uh, that is preventing us from moving forward in terms of economic development. That kind of mentality. Now, the important thing, okay, not really the important thing, one of the important things about the Maharlika investment is how it will be governed. Because as I've said in, in my other uh, engagements, you know, as, as, as I've said, uh, the key to the success of the Maharlika investment fund is the people that the government will appoint. Okay? So now it's important for us to understand uh, who are the people who are going to run the Maharlika investment fund. So let's take a look. The Maharlika Investment Fund has an advisory body. That advisory body consists of three people. So first you have the Secretary of, of Budget, 
which is, I think, it's Secretary Amina uh, Pangandaman. And then you have the NEDA Secretary, Secretary Balisakan, and the National Treasurer. So there's three of them. And what they will do is they provide guidance, you know, they advise and assist the formulation of general policies, and they recommend who to appoint in the director positions, which I will discuss in a bit. So what they will do, the advisory body, is that they will provide advice to the board of directors of the Maharlika Investment Corporation. So who sits in the board of the Maharlika Investment Corporation? So you have the secretary of uh, the Department of Finance, the CEO of, of the Maharlika Investment Corporation, the presidents of Land Bank and DBP, now, two regular directors, and three independent directors from the private sector. So the qualifications of these people, the regular and independent directors specifically are listed here. They have to be citizens of the Philippines at least 35 years of age, has a you know, good moral standing and reputation, with recognized probity and independence, must be experts in finance, economics, investment, business management, or law. The uh, regular directors will serve for, for a three-year term and independent directors will serve a one-year term renewable up to nine years. The board of directors of the Maharlika Investment Corporation will create the audit committee and the risk management committee. So these committees are important because they are key to safeguards, which I'm gonna talk about later. Um, the board of directors will govern the Maharlika Investment Corporation, okay? And they will uh, manage you know, uh, the, the CEO and they will govern pretty much the, the people who are gonna run the Maharlika Investment Corporation and the people who are gonna run the Maharlika Investment Corporation. It's the CEO, and then you all have the chief investment and operating officer. And below that, you have the fund managers and other staff. Um, and also the board of directors, they will engage the internal auditor, external auditor, the commission and audit, and the politicians who will be sitting in the joint congressional oversight for the Maharlika Investment Fund. So let's look at um, investments and uh, potential for revenue, okay? Um, there was a paper that was uh, published by the UP School of Economics. If you go to their UPSE discussion papers, the title of the paper is uh, Maharlika Investment Fund Still Beyond Repair. And what they're saying is that the Maharlika Investment Fund is redundant. It's redundant because there already exists what we call a national development corporation. And the national development corporation is uh, tasked to pursue commercial, industrial, agricultural, or mining ventures in order to give the necessary impetus for national economic development. In other words, the National Development Corporation is like the investment arm of the national government. So what they're saying is that no, the Maharlika Fund is just, a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a, a redundancy. But actually, if you were to look at the investments of the National Development Company, you will see that many of these investments are in, in local infrastructure. In other words, you don't see investments that are, for example, they're, they're not buying stocks. They're not buying bonds. They're not buying um, other investments, you know, uh, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, commodities. They're not. It's limited to these kinds of projects. Okay, so that's number one. So there's no redundancy there. Okay, um, under the law, the Maharlika Investment Fund allows for a wide array of investment possibilities. As I've said, you have, you know, you have uh, commodities. They can buy foreign currencies, cash. Uh, fixed income instruments, uh, which is like uh, sovereign bonds, uh, equities, etc. It's all listed here. In terms of revenue potential, uh, let's look at our neighbors, right? So Temasek, for example, they started their sovereign wealth fund in 1974. Now the total value of their fund it sits at around uh, uh, more than 350 billion Singaporean dollars in a span of like 50 years. Okay. Um, the China Investment Corporation, I have here data, uh, the China Investment Corporation, that's a sovereign wealth fund for China, uh, as of 2021, their net cumulative annualized return, that's net, by the way, it's at 7.2%. Their net annual return is at 14.27%. So, kumikita, no, it's earning. Um, let's look at Kazana, which is the uh, sovereign wealth fund for Malaysia, which is, by the way, this is not one MDB, there's one with these MDB separate. So you have Kazana. Uh, when Kazana began in 2004, their portfolio value, or uh, the, the asset value, right, sits at uh, around 33 uh, billion uh, sing, uh, Malaysian uh, ringgit. Now it's at uh, 81 billion. Okay, so it has grown. 
So we see that there's a need for the Maharlika Fund. We see that there is a revenue potential. But what are the challenges that the fund is facing? So number one is graft and corruption. So we don't want the, the, what happened with 1MDB to happen with the Maharlika Investment Fund. Let me give you a, a glimpse of what happened with 1MDB. So here, did, you can see in your screen a, uh, a diagram, okay? so, uh, which, is, which tells you the flow of money from 1MDB going to their uh, uh, form, former, and by the way, now detained Prime Minister Najib Razak. The 1MDB fund, which is around $2.4 billion, that was meant for a company called AA Bar Investments PJS, which is a legitimate company that's based in Abu Dhabi. In other words, 1MDB is going to invest in AA Bar Investments, PJS. But what happened here was that two of the officials of AA Bar Investments PJS set up a company called AA Bar Investments PJS Limited in the British Virgin Islands. And instead of investing in the legit company, the one with the PJS, it went to the one with the PJS Limited in British Virgin Islands. And 2.4 billion went to this. It went to some intermediaries, and then eventually it reached Najib accounts, uh, Najib Razak's uh, account. So, in other words, because of uh, of the deception, you know that that was that happened here in terms of the investments. It was too late when the public knew that you know that uh, the the money was being stolen. Okay. So yeah, so graphing corruption indeed is a challenge in any sovereign wealth fund. It's not just with Maharlika, but in any sovereign wealth fund, graphing corruption is a challenge. Number two, in economics we have a term called moral hazard. So what do we mean by moral hazard? So moral hazard, and I quote, is the risk that a party has not entered into a contract in good faith or has provided misleading information about its assets, liabilities, or capacity. So in addition, moral hazard may, only mean, may also mean a party has an incentive to take unusual risks in a desperate attempt to earn a profit. So the idea is that since, you know, if, if let's say I'm a fund manager with the Mahali Fund and I know that it's not my money anyway, it's the government's money, or I could spend it, you know, recklessly. I could uh, 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 put it in investments that I know is very risky, right? Without, you know, without regard as to whether or not it will earn, right? So there's this moral hazard. So that is a challenge. That's why I'm saying the key to the success of the fund is by appointing the right people and, and people who will uh, obey, you know, who will follow the rules, uh, which, which I'm gonna discuss later on, like uh, uh, how to address this moral hazard issue. And of course, there are external challenges. So you have geopolitics like Russia, NATO tensions, you know, US China strategic competition. You also have cyber attacks, climate change, you know, and, and all other external risks. So, what are the safeguards then? So, the safeguards include it's in the law already. So, you have internal audit, you have an external audit, and then, of course, you have the commission and audit in there, and there's the joint congressional oversight. Um, the law itself uh, speaks of transparency. I remember it's one of those things that I was really pushing for, that the Maharlika Fund should be very transparent. And according to Section 18, it says here that the investment and risk management plans, strategies, and activities of the Maharlika Investment Corporation shall be disclosed and published on its website. There you go. So there will be a website that will be immediately updated and made easily accessible to the public. So note the words there immediately updated, made easily accessible to the public, okay? Um, in section 39, there's also the right to freedom of information. So it says here that all documents of the Maharlika Investment Fund shall be open, available, and accessible to the public, okay? So what's available to the public? So number one, all investments by the Maharlika Investment Corporation. Remember what happened with 1MDB? It's important for us to know where which companies uh, the, the money went, okay, for us to know if it's a legitimate investment. Number two, uh, the public has access to the sal ends of the members and officials of the Marlika Investment Fund, the, the, the board of directors, the committees, etc. The sal ends of those who are appointed and designated, the audit documents from the COA and similar documents and other pertinent information. So clearly, the, 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 the Marlika Investment Fund has the, has the transparency provisions. Very, very important. 
Also the law, which I'm not gonna discuss in detail, the law itself uh, uh, lists the qualifications of the officers and also the penalties for the offenses. Although my, uh, my opinion here is that the penalties for the offenses do not commensurate to the potential money that, you know, that they can uh, uh, steal. You know, if, if it goes to that point where there's graphing corruption, the penalties do not commensurate with the possible amount that can be stolen. And of course, there's adherence to the Santiago principles, which is essentially uh, a 24 generally accepted principles and practices. Uh, and, and what it is, essentially, it's an agreement between countries that have sovereign wealth funds to harmonize the policies that are related to transparency, governance, accountability, and so on. Okay, So the law itself says that they're going to adhere with the Santiago principles. And that's it. So thank you for your time. And yeah, please follow me on Facebook. So I do have a Facebook account. So it's Dr. Batus FB. And you can also follow me on YouTube, Dr. Batu Sabwaiti. So thank you for your time. And I think now we have the, we can spend some time with the questions from the audience. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Bato, for your keynote speech. We have learned a lot about the Maharlika Fund, uh, especially for especially for those others na. Uh, who have still question with Maharlika Fund. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have today um, from the Public Relations of the Mineral Development Authority as our conference reactor for Dr. Michael's Bato, Michael Bato's uh, uh, keynote speech. We have here Dr. Adrian M. Tamayo. And also we have here the Vice President for the um, External Relations and International Affairs Office of the University of Mindanao. We have here Dr. Rinaldo Castro. Uh, yes, good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bato. Um, I hope you don't mind with my background because I'm actually, you know, in this time in, and in this period, you have we have our office at our home and our home usually at our office and in the middle are actually our cars. So I am uh, doing some of my work inside my car while going to the uh, next event. By the way, I'm Adrian Tamayo and I am uh, working with the Mindanao Development Authority. And one of the many concerns actually of Mindanao is the limitation of budget. And in fact, uh, last 2022, we noted a 7.2 increase in our gross domestic product and it's just 7.2%. However, when we try to uh, translate that, it means uh, we were able in Mindanao, uh, we were able to earn uh, 200 billion more. And we were thinking, where are these coming from? These were actually coming from the expansion of services owing to the return to work after the pandemic and the manufacturing. But during the pandemic, uh, Dr. Bato, it is actually the agriculture sector that actually helped the whole nation because uh, only the agriculture sector did not shrink down the negative uh, threshold. So, so it actually telling us why after the pandemic when in, uh, we have a v-shaped type of recovery and uh, after the, the the return uh to work after the pandemic after the lifting of the lockdown uh services were expanding the manufacturing were expanding yet the agriculture fishery and aquaculture remain to be at that relatively slow moving uh growth the reason it's because of investment um, we have limited because uh, some are thinking that it would take a longer time gestation period uh, for an investment. And I'm very happy that you were able to mention the very reason why the Maharlika was uh, introduced. One, because it is an innovation that is teaching us an imagination that is put to work that during the period we cannot only rely on the government fund. And you have mentioned even the fiscal space, the need for the uh, fiscal space in order to look at, again, those potential uh, potential items by which the private partner partnership can do the, the investment no, on the non-traditional um, portfolio can be done. And true enough, uh, Dr. Bato, you have mentioned we are a heavy GAA kind of a country, which uh, in the concept of development and growth 
we have to shift from a heavy GAA to another form of investment, which you have actually highlighted. And I am very happy because I am in the same spot. And therefore, uh, we have and we have to uh, we have to celebrate the kind of thinking that you have highlighted uh, here. Perhaps you may not able to call it that uh, uh, exactly, but I may just uh, term it right because at your presentation, you were able to mention that we are becoming a courageous nation. That during this time of expansion, we have plenty of assets and opportunities to use. And therefore, this Maharlika is a, a form of a, a condor, a kind of innovation that we could use while all others are already using it. But this time, we have to trust the elements of the government because for some years, for many years, some are always looking at, uh, can the government handle this? You have mentioned the very important element, which is trust in the government. And the many countries that went through thinking the recovery to expansion, their, their citizens trusted their government. And this is one evidence. And you have uh, mentioned it very uh, clearly. And I would just uh, again highlight it. You have mentioned that this Maharlika investment fund is a return to our dignity to the government that we need to support also. And you have mentioned here economic relationship of the growth as well as of uh, that investment. And pretty sure when the regular budget is being um, freed up, then we could identify many items. In Mindanao, uh, I could tell um, Dr. Uh, Batu that six in 10 workers are actually working in agriculture. But we cannot move to manufacturing to the higher value chain. It's because of the lack of, uh, of investment. So with this one, gaps, no, items that uh, would need for investment can also be addressed with the Maharlika Fund. And there is actually the, that great debate on the redundancy issue, whether the Maharlika Fund is a redundant to the function of the DBP and Land Bank, and you have mentioned it very well, and it's never a redundancy, but instead it is strengthening our financial system. And uh, if uh, you were also able to mention the moral hazard of which a decision of an individual, or we could have it as a because it is a problem of an agency uh, theory. And associated with that is the adverse selection. When we decide on, on some many options that came out that the, the decision happened to be wrong. However, we can also provide some solutions to that by providing the concepts of one, the delayed gratification. That means let us allow that to settle first before bringing in our own plenty of comments, complaints on a particular system. Allow things to first achieve its learning curve, that high learning curve. And it takes time, uh, such as in our Maharlika uh, investment fund. Another is on the bounded rationality, such as the common expressions of Dr. Bato, oh, sabi ko na nga sayo, mali yan, oh. Because that's the bounded rationality, but that is also a result of an impulse. Most of the people jump into confusions because of an impulse. But as a nation that we are expanding, you have mentioned that we are becoming a growing economy. And we could even mention that in, in Mindanao because Mindanao is a 60 billion US dollar economy, uh, three times bigger than Brunei, three times bigger in terms of uh, production. Uh, bigger than Nepal, bigger than Turkmenistan, almost bigger than Slovenia, uh, Lithuania, uh, bigger than Cyprus. So we are becoming, and, and what you have mentioned are elements uh, that could uh, provide us even more confidence to proceed. But of course, there are investment gaps and the Maharlika Fund uh, could provide it well. In a word, uh, I mean, in in, in uh, I think the best way to, to sum up uh, and the way to react to your state, uh, to your presentation, Dr. Bato, is that I could uh, bring again 
uh, the book of uh, Nobel Prize uh, awardee, uh, Esther Duflo, when he was saying, uh, she was saying that the success of every project of any nation starts with the interest, with the intention. And what we have with the Maharlika, he is fully bounded with the interest and the intention for the country to move forward. And thank you very much, Dr. Bato, for the many um, concepts, no, new things that I've learned. And on behalf of our Secretary uh, Acosta from the Mindanao Development Authority, we are uh, very happy to learn from you and to more many concepts that you could provide us uh, for a greater, uh, wider, and more active discussion for the many things that, to that are to come to our country and, of course, that would benefit Mindanao. Thank you very much, Dr. Batu. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tamayo, for the very uh, kind uh, uh, reaction. And I, I really uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the remarks and the uh, observation you know, uh, about the uh, Maharlika uh, Investment Fund. And I, I'm very uh, confident that Mindanao will receive uh, a lot of these uh, funding that, that will come from the Maharlika Investment Fund. And in addition, Remember, the president also did a lot of uh, investment uh, uh, roadshows and uh, uh, economic briefings. You know, there's a lot of investment pledges, and I'm uh, confident and not just hopeful. You know, I'm I'm confident that Mindanao will uh, be a recipient of a large chunk of those uh, um, investment uh, pledges once they become realized. You know, and and in the sauna on Monday. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, that the president will mention Mindanao uh, uh, more, you know, uh, uh, than in the first sauna. So hopefully he will do that because Mindanao is, is a very important uh, part of our country, not just, you know, agriculturally, but in terms of, you know, other things. Uh, and it's a major economic engine of our country, you know. So, um, and, and yeah, thank you for those kind of uh, uh, remarks. And, you know, uh, you know we'll, I hope we see each other soon, huh? <laughs> sure, we will be very happy to host you here in Mindanao, uh, uh, Dr. Bato. Hope you can visit us. Yes. All right. So do we have questions uh, from the audience? Uh, I, I, I'm... I'm if there's time, I, I, I'm uh, open to um, uh, answering questions from the audience. Uh, hello, Dr. Michael. We have here another conference reactor. We have Dr. Reynaldo Castro, the VP okay. of Regional Relations and Alumni Affairs of the University of Mindanao. Thank you, Kondra. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Bato. Nice to see you here uh, in Good our- Good morning. Conference. Yeah. Um, for sure, our participants are also glad and happy to listen to you. They are also your followers uh, in YouTube and in your Facebook, uh, in many of the uh, occasions that you have uh, shared no, your economic point of view in many national issues. Uh, and it's also nice that we listen to you live, no, uh, virtually in our conference. With regards to your topic today about Mahalika Fund, um, the way that I understand that the sovereign wealth fund, as practiced by many countries, no, um, as you mentioned, also like Trinidad and Tobago and Norway, as far as I know, Norway probably has the biggest uh, share in the uh, sovereign wealth fund. Countries have to meet several conditions, like, for example, the first one is capability. And as you mentioned, that common sources of this um, sovereign wealth fund should come from the current account surpluses of uh, any country or any state for that matter. You know? And establishing a fund that generates significant benefits via saving, smoothing, or investment requires significant capital that many states or many countries lack. Establishing a fund also requires Necessity to save for future generation, smooth the effects of outside economic shock, especially if um, these funds are invested into foreign uh, sources, foreign investments uh, like hedging, hedge funds, or in any other type of investments. Um, or uh, invest in uh, local uh, opportunities. No, uh, Another thing is that 
how these funds uh, will be financed dif differ according to how this funds is financed, no? like commodity or non-commodity. And the stated objective of the fund, again, whether for saving, for stabilization, domestic or investment. Well, um, the thing about there is that uh, Dr. Tamayo has mentioned about bounded rationality, but probably I hope that this um, decision of government to create a sovereign wealth fund will not be a heuristics, uh, part of a heuristic approach no? in economics by Daniel Kahneman. You know? uh, it's just a, a, uh, an, an, an urgent decision without too much planning because in your presentation, there's a short timeline of preparation, discussion, public debate about the establishment of sovereign wealth fund. But if you're going to look at it, there is no something in the constitution that this sovereign wealth fund or the Mahalika wealth fund violates. Ibig sabihin, uh, there is no possibility that those who are naysayers can raise the matter to the Supreme Court because, uh, well, as they said, as they mentioned, that there's no unconstitutional about it. But there are... Um, there are reservations, for example, who will manage the fund, how the fund will be raised. And in fact, the very concern there is that the 50 billion, is it uh, correct? No, if I am correct, the 50 billion amount that will be taken from the land bank and from the DBP, which will potentially reduce the asset of these two government financial institutions. Another thing is that... Um, these government financial institutions have also investment departments and experts where they know where to invest these funds. So it's a duplication because as we learn in the experiences of other countries, creating a, a sovereign wealth fund should come from surpluses of a country. But again, right now, as you mentioned, the Philippines is facing a huge deficit. No? On another note, if the fund will be successful, this Philippine fund will be successful, it's going to be a, a new model for other countries that despite the fact that Philippines has no surpluses, yet it pursues this uh, sovereign wealth fund. And it's possible. No? And it will become a benchmark for other countries that, um, you know, you have... You have funds from your central bank. You have funds from your government, financial institutions, and the like. And you can make use of that for purposes of um, investing into infrastructure and other purposes for growth and development. My question, I only have one question there. Uh, there is no mention about how the public can participate in the fund, whether, you know, the the corporation, Maharlika Investment Corporation, to be created based on the law will allow also the public to participate, uh, especially in the invest investment of the fund. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Bato, and uh, we're glad to hear from you. Uh, we would love to listen to you in uh, future conferences and future gatherings. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, th thank you. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Castro. Thank yeah. you. Um, okay. So uh, about the public being able to invest, actually, there are two types of shares uh, that the Maharlika Investment Fund has. So first is you have the common shares. So these are the shares that have voting rights. So this comes from land bank, you know, a DBP, national government. And then you have what we call preferred shares. And that preferred shares is worth 25% of the total capitalization. So that is where any private investor can come in. So let's say if, if you are a, a rich you know, person with a lot of money where you want to park your money, you could do that via uh, preferred shares, but you don't have any voting rights. And in fact, uh, when uh, during the evolution of the Maharlika Investment Fund, in fact, there was some reservation about, you know, like one company controlling 25% of the authorized capital, right? Because that's like 125 billion. If everybody that was scrapped because the idea was that you know, it's, it's unlikely that you will have something like that. Uh, but I mean, now you have this, so the public can, and um, uh, one of the allowable um, investments of the Maharlika are bonds. So, so the Maharlika Investment Fund can actually sell bonds and the public can purchase those. So there's a way for the public to participate, you know, in nation building through the Maharlika Investment Fund, you know, so there is a, a, a way for this. 
And also, uh, you mentioned earlier about just want to react, uh, like a reaction to the reaction uh, about uh, the, you know surpluses. You know, because we don't have a surplus. That's actually what Diwa Gunigondo was saying: was that uh, we don't have a surplus. We have nothing to invest. But actually, the experience of other countries, just like I mentioned earlier, so you have Indonesia, so you have Peru, you have even India, where they set up their own investment funds, which are, by the way, these are not, uh, uh, for example, for the case of Indonesia, it, it's not tied up to uh, revenue. I mean, it's not tied up to uh, the current account. Rather, it was state revenues. Perfect. They were in the middle of a budget deficit when they did that, in the middle of COVID as well. Mm -hmm. So so imagine if like, other countries were able to do it, uh, so it's just a matter of um, actually pulling resources together. Uh, and you're right, actually, because that would reduce some of the uh, assets of the, the GFIs. Like GFIs. The GFIs. And I agree with that 100%. But there's also potential for them to earn, right? If Because the, at, at the end of the day, when the fund earns, it will have to remit the profits back to the investors, in this case, the the government financial institutions. So, and and what we saw in the in terms of performance, there's a potential really uh, uh, for the long term for the fund to really grow exponentially. So, uh, um, yeah, and uh, you know, it, I'm I'm very confident, and I that you know uh, that our sovereign wealth fund will will be successful. I'm I'm confident because we have straight uh, we have the uh, although it rests primarily on the type of people that the president will appoint at the end of the day. That's why I was uh, uh, um, in, in one of the Facebook posts that I did a few days ago, I said what the president needs to do is to follow what Indonesia did, where they engaged a headhunter, a professional headhunters to shortlist the people that they're going to appoint. Because you know what mangyayari dyan, you know, the people who are interested to sit in the board, they will submit their resumes to to you know, to important people, to whoever close to the president, and and they will lobby. You alam niyan, meron tayong culture na parang it's called the manok system. You know, like may meron kang manok, you you would push for that person. I hope it doesn't get into that because if politics comes in, and by the way, the president also said himself that you know politics should be separated from this, and I agree with him hundred percent. He's correct. Politics should not play a part in terms of selecting the people who will run the fund. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Rinaldo Castro, the VP for uh, External Relations and Alumni Affairs of the University of Mindanao, and also to Dr. Michael Bato for his uh, keynote speech for this morning. Thank you so much, sir. And now let us first present our certificate appreciation to our keynote speaker and to our conference reactors. Allow me first to read the citation, um, the Institute of Enterprise and Econom Economy Studies presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Michael B. Bato as a keynote speaker during the Second Regional Student Research Congress and Second Regional Research Conference on Re Recent Issues and Trends in Business Accounting Management and Economics with the theme, Advocating Data-Driven Research and Development is Sustaining Economic Recovery held on July 21, 2023 via Zoom meeting, given this 21st day of July in the year 2023 Philippines, signed by Dr. Jan Vianney B. Morsha, Director of the Institute of Economy and Enterprise Studies, signed by the, our Vice President for Research and Publication, Dr. Maria Linda B. Arquiza, and signed by our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Henio Jr. S. Guhao. Once again, our appreciation to our keynote speaker, Dr. Michael B. Bato. Thank you so much for gracing your time with us on the second IEES conference, sir. Yeah, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Yes, sir. And uh, another certificate of appreciation is given to our conference reactor, Dr. Adrian M. Tamayo. Sir, thank you so much for joining us well for today. Uh, uh, before, before that, uh, I, I hope you won't mind me spoiling the system, uh, but I think there's a question for Dr. Batu uh, in the chat box uh, from Paul Moyon. Uh, okay. I think it's also uh, good to uh, look at that now because that would add up to our discussion. So okay. Pato, sir, oh, yeah, sure. I, I would be open to um, answer. We, uh, we have time. Time permitting, though. Like, uh, do we have, have time just to answer this uh, question? Yeah, uh, um, okay, so I'm just going to read the question. It's, it says here, hi, Dr. Batu. We just want to ask your insight about my reservation about the effect of the Maharlika Wealth Fund to our institutions and taxpayers particularly. 
Uh, for startup capital, the government will pool the resources of government financial institutions, such as the Land Bank, the Development Bank, Banco Central, to maximize the returns for these organizations. These resources are considered okay. So, however, it also limits the ability of these institutions to independently pursue their individual legal mandates in accordance with the best interests of their um, respective uh, clients. Okay, so uh, first part is that um, the, the, the money that uh, the GFIs are contributing to the fund are part of the investable funds anyway. Okay, so they're, although Dr. Tamayo was correct that it will reduce the assets of these GFIs, but then those funds are part of their investable funds anyway. So that's number one. Number two is that uh, for the case of the uh, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, the, 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 the remittances, uh, not really remittances, but the dividends that they're going to put in through the to go to the fund, it's part of their dividends that they remit to the national government anyway. So uh, that's, that's their profit, right? Because the central bank, they engage in uh, uh, exchange, they're, they're selling exchange rate and they earn out of synergy, right? Synergy, I think they call it. And the profits, that's the one that they remit to the national government. So, uh, so, so that one, uh, because here the, the question is that it limits their ability to independently pursue their legal mandates. Uh, well, true that because it there, there's some crowding, there's some crowding out that is going to happen there because you know the investable funds will be re, uh, will be reduced. It will be crowded out by the Maharlika fund, right? So in economics, we have the crowding out effect. Uh, but uh, we also have to look at it in the long term because what if? And again, there's a big if here. The fund becomes successful. Right, whatever uh, whatever resources they've pulled into the fund, they would earn more than what they've initially invested. So there's a potential for them to earn, and that would pers that would help them pursue their legal mandates in the future. Right. So again, it's like the Banco Central and the GFIs; they're investing, right? So that that's that's what it is. And the 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 key here is how to manage the risks, right? Does the Maharlika fund have have uh, 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 safeguards, which it has? The, the the thing that needs to happen now is the president appoint the right people for the job. And of course, the public having a watchful eye on where the funds are going. So that's the important piece here is that we have to be vigilant. You know, we have to we have to uh, uh, look very carefully at where you know the fund managers are are putting in these public funds. Thank you for the question.